Hello, good afternoon, everyone. Hope you're all doing fine. Welcome to our webinar this afternoon, maybe morning or evening, wherever you are joining us from. You will let us know in a little bit. Yes, now I can see people joining. Hello, welcome. Welcome, everyone. It's good to see people joining. Great. Okay. I will be a little bit uh, strict with time today uh, as we have quite of a packed agenda. So I'll get started. And um, afterwards, uh, as you know, we will be sending the recording. So uh, if you'll be joining, if someone will be joining later, they can also catch up uh, with the recording. So yeah. Uh, first things first, I would like to start with a little icebreaker. I personally always like this one. Um, so if you can tell us in the chat, so you can find it in the um, bar below, um, where you are joining us from today, that would be great. I am joining from uh, Copenhagen in Denmark and Martin and Carl, not too far from here, right? Right, I am in uh, our uh, office in Malmo. Yes, and I'm very close to our office in Malmo as well. Exactly, in Sweden, just across the bridge from Copenhagen, so we are not far. Okay, then it starts with the international crowd, and this is always fun. So we have US, US, so good morning, I guess, to you. Italy, not too far from here, so ciao. Spain, so not too far, US, Denmark, same as me, Arkansas, wow. International crowd, that's great. Perfect. So welcome, everyone, and welcome to the people who will be watching the recording wherever you are. Um, so I'll get started and get some housekeeping going. Um, so as I've just said, our webinar is being recorded. So if you, get, uh, if you want to later come back to a part uh, at your own pace, you can do so. We will be sending the recording um, hopefully tomorrow. And if you have any questions during the webinar, feel free to ask it to us in the same tab where you found the chat. You can find an area uh, saying Q&A and you can ask your questions there and other people can upvote. Um, and if you have any comments or you would like to reach out uh, to me during the webinar, uh, you can use the chat and you can choose either if you want that message to display for everyone or for the hosts and panelists. So. That's it for our skipping. I think I didn't miss anything. And then um, what we will cover today, a quick, I'll give you a quick introduction uh, about Debrit. And then uh, Martin uh, will uh, go on and, and uh, uh, tell you a little bit more about what is SPOM, the challenges, the drivers, and then Carl will uh, show it to you. So maybe, I don't know, Martin and Carl, if you want to quickly introduce yourself so people will know you a little bit more. Sure, I can start. So I'm Martin. Um... I work here at the BRICT, uh, primarily working with security and customer enablement. Yeah, and I'm Carl, and I'm working as a product manager. So I'm a link between our customers and our developers, setting up roadmaps and uh, executing on them. Perfect, and we look forward to see what you have to show today. Uh, and in the end, I forgot to mention, um, we will also have some more dedicated time for uh, Q&A, and also I will recap the session. So without further ado, I'll get started. Quick introduction, as I said, to Debrict. Um, Debrict is a company uh, that was funded by a spin-off of a, a research university research project. And now we are a team of around uh, 50 people. Uh, their headquarters is in Malmo, where Martin and Carly are. Uh, but we are spread um, around many different countries. And we are part of the Open Tech Cybersecurity and 45 teams. Um, and Debrict, for those of you who are new to the tool, is a software composition analysis tool. And basically, we help developers by helping you find and fixing your vulnerabilities, ensuring your licenses are compliant, and also uh, helping you find and compare your next open source project. But today, it's about SPOM, and this is what Martin is going to uh, introduce you to. So Martin, go ahead. And Thank take you. over so, the stage screen. Yes, I will take over the screen as well. 
All right. So I guess you can see my screen now. Yes. Uh, so thank you, Benedita. And as Benedita said, we're going to talk about S bombs today. And I will give like a general introduction to this software bill of materials. And after that, Carl will show how we can do it in our tool. So just starting from the beginning, what is an S bomb? Well, S bomb is short for software bill of materials. And you can say that it is simply put a listing of dependencies in a software product. It is often compared in an analogy to like the ingredients that you see in food. So when you buy food, you see a list of ingredients, which allows you to make informed choices about buying that food or eating that food or not depending on your personal preferences. Um, and the SBOM is basically a similar thing. So it, it says what is included in the software or in a product that you buy uh, or a product that you, that you uh, develop if you are on the supplier side. And the main idea of the SBOM is to create transparency and visibility into the supply chain. And all this is okay in the analogy with the ingredients in food, but the SBOM is actually a little bit more. So the SBOM will also include metadata and it will also include related data uh, that you can have for the software. So for example, in the SBOM, you can also have encoded security data, you can have encoded license information, you can also have the, the, the relationship between the different dependencies of software components that you have. And in this sense, I think the analogy is not 100% perfect with the ingredients that you have in food, which is the like the, the common analogy that many people like to use. So let us start to look at a few of the benefits and use cases. So one of them is to get better software in general. So what, what do we mean by better software here? Well, the main selling point nowadays when it comes to SBOM is security. So what you can do when you know the software that you have is that you can easily map the software to existing vulnerabilities and you can immediately find new vulnerabilities that affect the code that you're either developing or the code that are inside software that you have uh, purchased. And you can not, not only can you map the software to new vulnerabilities, but it is also possible here to add vulnerability information directly into the, to the SBOM file. So while security is maybe the main selling point here, uh, another very common use case is license compliance. So with the SBOM and knowledge of the software, you can help avoiding violating licenses. So the license will basically say what you are allowed to do with the software and under what circumstances you are allowed to do that and what requirements are put on you as a user of a specific piece of software. And here you can also embed the license information within the SBOM. So within the SBOM, you can find, for example, a license identifier, or you can have a link to a license file. You can even have the complete license text, and you can have a combination of all these uh, things as well, of course, depending on how much information you want to put inside the SBOM. Another be uh, benefit for better software is dependency health. So if you know the dependencies, if you know what is inside your software, it will also be easier for you to identify if there are any old components in your software. So you can also here identify components that are using bad practices or communities that are not really active at the moment. So maybe something has not been updated for a long time and maybe you want to uh, take a second look on that component to see if that is really something that you want to use. And here you can, of course, if you know the software, you can go to the GitHub repo, you can look at other metrics and see what is specific for this specific software. And is there something that we don't find very good uh, regarding, for example, the community, how are, uh, how is security treated for this specific component and so on. And this SBOM can then be used to analyze all these dependencies that you have inside your software. All these things are really good, of course, but it is very important to remember that the SBOM in itself doesn't provide very much value. In itself, it provides a lot of valuable data, but this data is not really useful unless you have processes surrounding this SBOM. So, for example, when you have an SBOM uh, or you want to create an SBOM, you need to ask yourself some questions. So who will create the SBOM and how often should you create the SBOM? 
and who will analyze the S-bomb and how often should you analyze this S-bomb? Uh, and these are things that you really need to uh, take care of and think about when you are digesting or producing a, an S-bomb. And if there are things within the S-bomb that uh, you uh, want to take action on, um, you need to determine what action should be taken uh, upon different uh, circumstances and who is going to take these actions. And also what supporting tools are we going to use when we're going to work with this SBOM. So just having the SBOM as a file gives you a lot of data, but it doesn't give you all the information that you need. You need to have processes around this to extract the information and use it in the best way. So I think this is very important to remember. The SBOM itself is not... Uh, only the solution here. Apart from better software, you can also look at some business values that you get from the SBOM. So uh, the main goal here, one of the main goals at least, is to have increased transparency in the supply chain. So with an SBOM, it, it is much more difficult for a supplier or a developing organization to hide by bad practices. So with the SBOMs, now customers can scrutinize the software and the supplier can now also be judged by their practices. So if the supplier is not patching the software as they should or choosing software that is um, horribly out of date, then the customers can now judge the uh, suppliers by their, these practices and maybe choose another supplier. So this, of course, will incentivize the supplier and the developing organization to patch the software and use good software in the end. Having an SBOM will also uh, provide you with the benefit of having a stronger supplier-customer relationships. So now, assuming that you are a good developing organization, that you are patching your software, you are taking care of the... Um, dependencies of the software that you choose, now you can show these good practices to your customers and then you can get the benefit from showing that you are really having uh, well-developed software. And this will also give you a competitive advantage because consider uh, a customer that chooses between two different suppliers. One of the suppliers will provide you with an SBOM. The other supplier will not provide you with an SBOM when you're buying the software. So which one would you choose? Well, all other things equal, you can reason, of course, why would they not supply an SBOM? Is it because they don't know how to generate an SBOM? Is it because there are unknown vulnerabilities? Is it, is it because there are unknown outdated software? Or do they not even know about if there are vulnerabilities or not? Do they not even know if there are bad software inside the product that they are, they are selling? So, of course, all, all other things equal, it is... Uh, very likely that you would choose the supplier that will provide you with an SBOM. Also, with an SBOM, you can facilitate an ongoing discussion with your customers. And this is an opportunity to build trust because the customer looking at the SBOM can start asking you questions. Well, is this patched? Do Are we uh, vulnerable to this specific vulnerability? What were you thinking when you included this component? Because it seems a little bit outdated. And assuming that you have well-founded uh, decisions here, you can discuss this with your customers and you can build a trust between you and the customer. Of course, there will be an overhead in the number of questions that you get. And sometimes you will get questions that are not uh, really, really good questions. And maybe they will talk about vulnerabilities that are really out of scope, but still this overhead could be said to be compensated by the fact that now you have the ability to have an ongoing discussion with the customer. And this provides a better relationship between the supplier and the customer. With the SBOM, you can also argue that you will reduce the remediation cost and the time to market for the product. Because if you can find the problems in your software earlier, it also means that you can fix these problems earlier. And the earlier you start fixing problems, the cheaper it will be to fix them. Also, if you choose better components, you will also have less future problems. And now with less future problems, it will allow your developers to focus on developing new features, focus on uh, UI, UX, focus on stability and the performance of the product, which will also decrease the time to market. Ah, also, uh, I almost forgot. So 
we're going to take like a 30 second uh, break here and ask a question uh, to you. So Benedita, you want to take over from here? Yeah, I will uh, launch our newly poll. So it would be great if you, um, if you can vote on the scenario that makes more sense for you so we can understand a little bit more about um, some trends here in real time. Okay, we will give uh, 10 more seconds so that Martin, you can comment the answers. Okay. There. Yes, let's see if I Coming can find. To see the, to find the big winner. What, what, are, what is your uh, guess, Martin, your experience? <laughs> I think today the main driver is uh, security. Um, okay, so I'm that's it. Guessing... I'm going to end the poll. So yeah. I'll give three seconds, three, two, one, and uh, let's share the results. And Martin, let's see if you are right or not. Okay. So you can, can see, see it, it, right? So it looks like yeah, you guessed it so... right. I guess it's right. So uh, the majority, or not the majority, but out of the four, there were most votes for the security data uh, with license and business value as the second place. Uh, dependency health coming in as the third place. Yeah, makes sense. Uh, okay. Okay. I'll uh, stop sharing. Okay. So uh, let's get back. See if I can. Okay. Um, so what are the drivers and the motivators uh, behind this? So we can start looking at compliance and regulatory requirements. So one very well cited uh, driver here is the cybersecurity executive order that uh, US President Biden uh, published in May 2021, so soon uh, two years ago. And if you look at this uh, executive order inside it, it, it says a lot of things, this executive order. But one thing that people often want to point to is that if you want to do business with the U.S. government, you need uh, to provide the purchaser a software bill of materials for each product directly or by publishing it on a public website. So while, while SBOM has been around for longer than two years, of course, this cannot, this cannot really be seen as something that sparked the big interest in SBOM, but this has really been a catalyst for uh, the interest here. If we continue to look uh, at the US, there are several other laws and guidelines and requirements. So for example, the DHS, Software Supply Chain Risk Management Act, is a law that is not a law yet, but it is like a proposed law. It's inside the system. It's, I think it is in the, in the Senate right now. Uh, to mandate that every, every contractor should send to the Department of Homeland Security an SBOM. Uh, and also the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration had put out guidelines um, that are not really binding, but they are guidelines that you need to uh, provide an SBOM. And there are also FDA requirements for so the Food and Drug Administration. They have for several years been trying to propose that everyone that puts medical devices on the market, they should provide an SBOM as well. And actually just a few months ago, there was an omnibus bill uh, in the US that included, so if you look here uh, at the highlighted text, so the omnibus, omnibus bill requires the submission of an SBOM to the FDA that includes all standard open source and critical software components or medical devices. So this has actually become a law now also in the US. And if we go to outside the US, we go to the EU, there will be an upcoming Cyber Resilience Act that will apply to all the vendors that puts digital elements on the market. So different from the US, this is not the ones that are doing business with the government. This applies to all the vendors that are putting something on the market that is like um, within the notion of a digital element. And for them, it is a requirement to generate an SBOM. So this will really be a driver uh, for this from the compliance uh, side. Other drivers uh, would be the cybersecurity threat landscape. So you could see in the poll that most of you thought that security was the main uh, use case here. So uh, let us look at some of the vulnerabilities. So uh, some vulnerability information. So looking at NVD, the number of um, vulnerabilities that were enumerated by NVD has been increasing steadily for a long time. And in 2022, they, for the first time, uh, surpassed 25,000 uh, 
uh, in one year. So just having a lot of vulnerabilities, one thing, but are they exploited? So here we can look at data from IBM that says that 34% of attacks, they exploit the vulnerabilities as an, as an attack vector. Uh, a report from ENISA looking at the entities that provided uh, incident reports uh, as part of the NIS requirement, 69% of these reported that a majority of security incidents are caused by exploitation of vulnerabilities. So you can really see that vulnerabilities are, are used to a large extent. And another report from IBM said that the global average cost of a data breach that are caused by vulnerabilities in third-party components is estimated to be more than 4 million US dollars. You can really see the cybersecurity threat landscape here as a, as a big driver. So there are challenges around an SPOM. You can just creating an SPOM, you, you, can, you can easily say, but it's not that easy to do all the time. So what are the challenges that you can find here? So one challenge is completeness. So completeness means that that could be missing components. We could be miss some, some software components that are not inside the SPOM, and that will, of course, uh, miss a lot of data that is potentially interesting. But that could also be missing information regarding a specific component. And we also need to make sure to document known unknowns. And this means that if you have a dependency and you do not know if this dependency has dependencies uh, in itself, then you need to document that this is the case. And if you are sure that it does have it, then you need to document that they have it. So all the uncertainties here needs to be documented. Another challenge is that this SPOM needs to be up to date. So if you include external data inside the SPOM, so for example, vulnerability information, this could be very quickly uh, out of date because new vulnerabilities, as you could see, are found a lot. So last year, it was like 25,000 new vulnerabilities only in NVD. And obviously, you cannot use a few months old uh, S-bombs if you encode vulnerability information in it because it will be outdated. And uh, to help with this, you can have support from automation and software composition analysis. You also want to make the S-bomb actionable. And this means that the S-bomb information must be targeting the actual use case. So if security is your use case, you need to have security information. If license is the use case, you need to have license information. And for example, for security information, you need to have unique identifiers. Otherwise, you would not be able to map it to new vulnerabilities because several different software can have uh, the same names. You will need a unique identifier in this case. Otherwise, it is not actionable. So just briefly looking at the SBOM file. So as part of the cybersecurity executive order that I discussed previously, it said that within 60 days, of the date of the order, the administrator of the National Telecommunications and Information Administration, NTIA, shall publish a set of minimum elements for an SBOM. So they did. Uh, and the minimum elements of the SBOM is not just what is included in the SBOM, but this is also practices surrounding the SBOM. So they divide it into three different categories. The first category is data fields. So Within the SBOM, they say that the minimum requirement is that you need to have the supplier of the SBOM. Uh, you need to have the component name, you need to have the version, and you need to have other unique identifiers. And you also need to encode the relationship between the dependencies inside the SBOM. And you also finally need to include the author of the SBOM and a timestamp so we can know how old is this SBOM because otherwise we wouldn't know if data could be potentially very outdated or not. The next category that they discuss is automation support. So they say that it is very important uh, that SBOM generation can be automated because there are simply too many components in typical software in order to have uh, a manual handling of this. And automation also implies that the format should be machine readable. And this will also then facilitate interoperability between different systems. And NTIA also discusses practices and processes. So what they're saying, for example, is that every time you have a new release, you need to generate a new SBOM. 
you need to include all the direct dependencies of your software. But if you do not include transitive dependencies, you need to include enough detail so that they can be later identified. You need to be able to handle known unknowns, as I discussed before. And by to for underlining the importance that NT, NTIA thinks uh, for the SBOMs, they actually say that we should be we should accept initial minor errors in favor of fast adoption. So they really think that we should do this as soon as possible. So there are two main formats uh, out there today for SBOMs, and I will just very, very briefly uh, compare these two formats. So these are the Cyclone DX and the SPDX formats. Both of them has a set of sections in the um, SBOM file. Both of them start with some metadata, like the version of the specification that the file will follow, what is, who is the creator of the file, what tool was used for generation of the file, uh, and timestamps and so on. The next part is the actual components, uh, which are called packages in SPDX and then components in Cyclone DX. SPDX has a little bit more resolution here in that they can have specific files and snippets in files as well, because for example, a snippet of a file could have a different license uh, than other parts of the same file, but this level of resolution is not really supported by Cyclone uh, DX. They have, like, they have the components. Uh, in one section is that. Both of them have dependency relationships as a separate section. So here you say how one dependency relates to another one. So this one depends on this one, which depends on this one, and so on. And for security and vulnerability data, Cyclone DX has a separate section discussing just vulnerabilities and security, while this is something that is just given as, as external references in SPDX. So this is one uh, difference that you can see here. So what you what you the, the main conclusion here that you can rather easily draw from looking at the specifications is that SPDX is um, very focused on uh, licensing information, while Cyclone DX has a much larger focus on vulnerabilities and security data uh, for the different components. So this will be the end of what I'm going to say here. So. Now I'm going to hand over to Carl, who will show how the bricks can be used to work with the SBOMs, both from uh, generating SBOMs, but also from uh, scanning SBOMs uh, point of view. So Carl, you want to take Hello. over? And maybe while we transition, while uh, Carl is getting his screen up, if anyone has any questions about uh, Martin's presentation so far, it's a great time also to ask. Don't be shy. <laughs> so feel free to use the Q&A area for that. Like now it's a good time. OK, well, we have one question. Um, so Martin, the question we have from someone in the audience is, how does the SPOM relate to VEX or VEX? I'm not sure uh, how to. Ah, uh, yes, the VEX. VEX. Um, okay. Yeah. <clears throat> this is a good question. So th there are different, definitely relations. So the SBOM will give a list of uh, components, basically, while the VEX is basically also, it's also a machine readable file that will show what kind of, how vulnerabilities applies to a specific product or specific versions to a product. So what you can say in the VEX file is, for example, I have this product and then you have this set of vulnerabilities and this applies to this product and this in this kind of way. So either they do not apply, they are in triage, they, they do apply to the specific uh, product and version uh, and so on. And the specific relation here to SBOM, I, I would say is that the Cyclone DX is, is a format that supports VEX information, but SP, because it has so, so many uh, um, vulnerability fields that you can, you can enter, but this is not supported, for example, by the SPDX. Uh, SBOM format. Perfect. I'm not sure who asked the question, but um, hope this this answer. And if you have any follow up questions, just let us know. I guess uh, Carl, are you ready? To take yes, over? I'm ready. So thank you Perfect. very much, Martin and Benedita. Great.
it's very interesting to hear more about the SBOMs and what you can do and also how to make the most out of the data. But of course, the natural next question is how can we use the Debrick tool to generate and scan SBOMs and uh, make use of this data um, and automate it. So without further ado, I think we can jump right into it. And this mm -hmm. first slide is about how we generate SBOMs using the Brick. So there are two different ways of doing this. You can either do it directly through the UI or you can do it through the API. And I'm sorry for any background noises. My neighbor started to renovate just now, <laughs> an hour before this meeting. So it's a bad timing, but hopefully you can hear me well. Otherwise, let me know. Um, but yeah, there are two different ways. Um, and before you can generate the bomb, you of course have to integrate with the Brick and scan your manifest, manifest files. So we have the data for the generation of the bomb. When it comes to generating through the UI, this is built to be as simple as possible to use. So basically supporting the basic use case and just requiring a few clicks of a button in order to get your SBOM. Uh, you simply vis visit our main repositories page, click generate report, select the scope, and also then generate the SBOM. And may get it sent to directly to your email where you can download the results uh, and view it in your computer. It's also possible, like I mentioned before, to do it through the API. And this is to support a little bit more configurability. Uh, and then we'd suggest using the API because then you can select, for example, if you want to include vulnerability information or license information, you can choose to not only get it through an email, but also get it through the API. So then you simply visit our API page or look at our documentation. And in this API main page, you can look at all our different endpoints and one of them being the SBOM generate Cyclone DX SBOM endpoint. And through this, you can simply generate the SBOM and then receive it either through email or for another API endpoint. And I will show this in just a little bit. And what's very cool about having API endpoints, as a Debrick, we're working with an API first approach. So all the functionality that you have through the UI, you should also be able to do through the API. This supports a lot of comfortability and being able to do a lot of different things. So you can support many different use cases um, and SBOM generation is just one of those uh, functionality examples where you can, for example, use the API endpoints in the CI script. Um, so after you run a scan, you can automatically generate an SBOM and save that, uh, either consume it directly or generate an SBOM file into your repository. So you make sure that every time you scan with Direct, you generate an SBOM and you have it already in your repository. So I think we've talked enough and it's time to actually go into the UI and try to generate some SBOMs. So let me just go in here. I'm going to log in. And there we go. Let me just zoom in a little bit. There we go. So this is the main page for if there's anyone here who hasn't used the Debrick tool before, I can just give a super quick um, uh, overview of this view. It's the first view that you get when you're logged in, as you just saw. And here you can see all the repositories that you've integrated with the brick. So in this case, we have quite a, quite a few of them. And some overall information on vulnerabilities, so total amount of vulnerabilities, some critical and high vulnerability uh, accounts, and also some review statuses, which you can set per vulnerability. And if you go into a specific uh, repository, you can view a more specific list of vulnerabilities, which you can enter to read more about them. You can also look at which dependencies you've included in the repository, their relationships, and same here, also some vulnerability information and license information. And you can also read up about the list of all the licenses which you have uh, through your uh, packages in your repository. But we want to focus on SBOMs. So if we look at the button here on the top right, we actually see the generate report button for the UI that I was talking about. So by clicking here, we've automatically selected this repository for generation of reports. And then we can click SBOM, generate the SBOM, and then it's uh, started to generate. So it can take up to a few minutes, depending on the size of your repository, but it will be sent to your email, and then you can view it through there. And you can also, of course, configure this. You can generate with one repository. You can select several repositories. You can select the scope to be for your, all your repositories that you've integrated, and also for specific groups, because maybe one of your teams is working with a few subset of repositories and another team is working with another and then you can simply select the teams that you want to generate the SBOMs for. And I've already prepared the SBOM here from my email so you can see how it looks. Just gonna give a super quick overview uh, of uh, some of the things that Martin mentioned before. So in the top, we have some general information, high level information and metadata of the tool that it's being used and when the SBOM was generated as well as the supplier. And if we scroll down, we can view which files were included. This repository only contains one file, the yarn.lock. 
and we can read some information regarding this file. But scrolling down, it might maybe a little bit more interesting. Then we can go into the specific libraries which are contained in this repository. So we can see the CPE, the PURL, the name, the version, and also a BOM reference, which is used throughout the file to reference this particular, uh, particular package. And we can also see licenses. And here we have an example of an MIT license. And we have a link uh, to the proof of uh, license within the repository where we can find this information. Some license text, uh, if you'd like to read about the text for a specific package and license. And scrolling in a little bit further, we can see some external references regarding the license and other things regarding the library, and so on. And that continues for all the libraries which is contained within and scanned within your repository. Let's just search for vulnerabilities, and then we can go down a little bit further down into this one. And here we see the list of vulnerabilities. You can see things such as the CV ID, bomb reference again, the source, main source we get the vulnerability from, some severity score ratings, CWE ID, and description from the CWE, and also fixed recommendation. So in this case, this particular um, vulnerability affects the debug version 2.2.0, and you need to update the bug to 2.6.9 to fix this vulnerability. Um, yes, as you can see here in the, in the in text, if you have a 2.x.x, you have to update to this version. And if we scroll on even further down, we can view which packages we've included and their relationships. So we can see at the start here, we can see this is a reference to the main file, and this is all the direct dependencies it contains with the CPEs. And then down here, you can see actually for specific packages, which direct dependencies do they have? So this is always a reference to the direct dependency of a dependency. So this one will in turn show uh, Babel types is uh, uh, dependent on two fast properties, which in turn might be dependent on another direct dependency and so on. And using this information, it's possible to build an entire dependency tree uh, for that repository. Yes, so that's how we can do it for the uh, UI. But you can, like I said before, you can also do it um, through, um, yeah, you can do it for the API as well. Um, so by going in here, so now I'm in the main API page. Here you can see um, all the different endpoints that we have available. We have a Cyclone DX SBOM section. And here we can simply use the generate Cyclone DX SBOM. Um, and uh, just some information on that. You, you can provide all of these different um, parameters. So you can specify if there's a specific commit that you want to generate an SBOM for. You can specify the email you want it to send to. So normally for the UI, it's sent directly to the email of the logged in user, but you can specify a specific email here. You can also specify a number of repository IDs, which you want to use for this one, but you can find either for the API for another endpoint or for the UI directly in the URL. You can also specify specific branches, locale of the email, if you want to include vulnerabilities or licenses, if you want to send an email, so you can choose here if you want to have an email or if you want to receive it directly from the API. And last but not least, you can select which type of vulnerabilities I want included. By default, it's all of the ones that are shown in the UI. We can select to not show any unexamined vulnerabilities, for example, and uh, yeah, a bunch of different things here dependent on what vulnerabilities you want to see. So simply writing the version of the API 1.0, we can actually delete these because we're not going to be using the email. Let's head back into uh, the UI and just copy paste this one, uh, the ID of the repository. We're not gonna be specifying a specific branch, but we want to look at vulnerabilities and we want to look at licenses. We don't want to send an email, however, and we want to use the basic vulnerability statuses. So if we press execute here, oh, I actually have an expired JWT token. Just give me one second and we'll generate a new one. <clears throat> There we go. Now that I generate this, I get a report um, universal unique ID, which I can then copy from this endpoint. This can, of course, be done automatically if you set up a script for it. And then I copy this into the next one where we download result. And this here, you can ping this endpoint until the report is finished. But I think it's already finished. Yes, so it's loading now. This usually takes a couple of seconds, and we'll see result, result directly in the API. So we're just giving a little bit more on it should show. Yes, there we go. 
So down here, you can see exactly the same information we saw before, but directly in the API, if that's how you prefer to consume the SBOM. So that's very nice. And uh, like I said before, there's one last way, and that's for doing it directly for the CI. And uh, we have, we don't have a specific script set up for this, but like I mentioned, it's with the use of the API, you can do a lot of very cool things. So I have set up an example, the YAML file. So those of you who have set up a GitHub Actions flow with the Rict might be uh, familiar with this type of file where we, where we set up, this is the command that we use for scanning the Rict with a Rict token. And together with this command, we've added a generate SBOM section. So I'm not going to go into detail. I just wanted to show you roughly how we do it. We simply use the endpoints that we're using for our one. So uh, first we're doing a login, and then we're using, you can see our generate cyclone.dx SBOM. Then we're fetching the report uh, universal unique ID, and we're using it for the download uh, endpoint. And then in the end, we simply poll it until it's finished and we print the result into an sbom.json. So if we look at the flow here, you can see we will run a scan, we generate the sbom, and it's all contained here if we want to consume it directly, but then we also have it to, to save it as an artifact, which is very useful if you want to have it within the repository. So when it's successfully out, uh, uploaded, you can download it here if you'd like. So that concludes the sbom generation part. And I have one last thing I want to show you, and that's SBOM scanning. So when we scan SBOMs for the Rict, of course, uh, we first need to generate the SBOM. This can be done, for example, for the package manager. Uh, an example where we don't support it natively is C++ and the Conan package manager. Here, we don't support that file natively, but it's possible to generate an SBOM using their functionality. And the functionality in Cyclone DX actually have an open source package for this. You can also use Docker. They have native support for generating SBOMs. So you can scan your, uh, your um, containers and see those, uh, what's contained in them. But you can also, for example, uh, look at your vendor or supplier and ask them for, a, for an SBOM, just like Martin mentioned before. You can, you can uh, consume that through the Brict and uh, view it and also set up automations to see if they're compliant mm -hmm. with your rules. So same here, two different ways of doing it. Either you do it manually for the UI. It's also very simple. You visit the repository settings page, click manual scan, select the files, and start the scan. Or you integrate the repository containing the SBOM. When you're doing this, you can use either the CLI or API endpoints. And you simply run a debrick scan using the regular commands for the CLI, which is debrick scan, or these endpoints. And I'm not going to go into too much in detail here because this is this works just the same way as it would for any other manifest file. So we built the SBOM support to be as simple to use as possible. And last but not least, you can set up a CI CD to automatically update the latest SBOM when the Python runs. So I know we're a bit short on time, but we're just going to quickly go in and see how that can work in the UI. So here we are on the repositories page. If we go to repository settings, it's visible here. You can click manual scan. And then we simply upload our SBOM. I prepared a demo SBOM here. Quick scan. And it's sent up to break, the brick for scanning. And then we'll take a little while for it to look for all the components and match it. And it's done. And then we can go in here and view all the vulnerabilities and the dependencies and the licenses contained in it. So as you can see, it's super easy and super quick. And the last way we can do it, like I mentioned, is through a CICD. Here I have a repository, repo free SBOM, and we can set up an automation rule for that repository, which can trigger if it doesn't comply with our uh, rules that we set up. So for this specific repository, we have set up a rule, which for example, um, has sent a pipeline warning. If, a dependency, if it contains a dependency, which has a vulnerability that has not been marked as affected. So by just going into repository here, we'll upload a file. And we'll upload the very same file. And as soon as it's finished, we'll just commit this. And this should go very quickly. And then we basically start a scan, just as we would have in the manual upload. But this time, we actually have the repository integrated already. And it does the scan. And this, of course, can be set up. So you fetch, you can set up a flow where you get the um, SBOM automatically every time your vendor or supplier has a new update and you get it into your repository, triggers a pipeline, you scan your file, and then you find results. So in this case, you can see, for example, that we caused a pipeline warning because of the rule that I mentioned triggered. 
So it's a very useful way of automating this process of checking the SBOMs from your vendor or supplier or the SBOM that you're using uh, for your package manager. Um, and then making sure that it follows your policies just as for all your other manifest independency files. And that actually concludes the demo part. So um, thank you very much for listening to this. And I uh, hope you've seen how the brick can be both easy to use, but also configurable to suit your specific use case. Uh, we go to Benedita? Thank you, Carl. Yeah, we are uh, just in time. So if anyone has to leave, um, of course, uh, then you can um, also, I just have a couple more slides with a recap. Um, so if you don't have time to see it now, there's no problem if you want to watch it after in the recording. And also we have a couple of questions uh, from the audience in the meantime. Uh, I've answered to one of them uh, to Daniel, so let me know if uh, it was not clear, but there's still a, an open one. Uh, so Carl, maybe you can help with this one is from Daniel. Does the SPOM have a capability to capture audit comments? If you look at a vulnerable component and determine that you are not vulnerable based on usage, can that metadata be captured in the SPOM? Yeah, that's a very good question. Um, currently, we don't have support for um, uh, yeah looking at these audit comments um, to determine that for the tool automatically. But it's definitely something we can look into. Perfect. Thank very you. good question. Great. So as I said, uh, let me quickly share my screen. It's just a quick uh, wrap up. Yes. Do you see my screen now? Yes. So with uh, Zoom and screens, it's a bit confusing. I don't know if you, uh, everyone in the anyone in the audience has had that experience. But uh, yeah. Just a few things to um, walk away from today would be, as Martin showed there, uh, both with the examples in the US and also upcoming examples in the EU, there's increasing trends in regulatory requirements uh, or guidelines. So these uh, SPOMs are becoming a mandatory part of the supply chain and automating the SPOM generation also will be required. Um, and SPOMs are also helping to uh, create stronger supplier customer relationships because um, you can scrutinize an application's uh, components. And um, as Martin also mentioned, SPOMs do not really solve any problems on uh, their own. So there needs to be accompanied by organi organizational processes. So there is a, a very recent uh, blog post series that we have in our blog that you can read a little bit more uh, into detail if you if you would like that. Um, and then, of course, uh, as uh, Carl showed, we we are supporting uh, SPOMs in um, in Debrick, so we can help you with a specific use case with both the generation and scanning of SPOMs, uh, and uh, we will. That will help you to assess your security license and dependency health. And if you ever have um, any questions about um, SBOMs or any other things about Debrick, you can always use our support channels via email, chat, or you can also utilize our newly launched uh, one month ago portal where you can ask questions and it's where you can also um, find our documentation. So feel free to use that also and yeah that's 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 all for today i'm sorry that we took a little bit more of your time but uh, we hope this was useful and uh, when you log off from the zoom you have um a quick uh, survey uh just to ask if how how did you like the the webinar and tomorrow when we send you a follow-up with the recording if you also want to give some qualitative feedback we are always grateful for that so we can improve and make better webinars in the future. So yeah, without uh, any more thing to say, I'll leave you for your day for the people in the US um, and for a good evening for the people in Europe. And I'll see you soon. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you, everyone. Bye.